Great Lakes Shipwrecks Live. Uh, very, very cool evening planned for you tonight. Um, as you can see, um, I uh, couldn't take it anymore in my uh, in my kitchen. Uh, I had to get out of here. Uh, Wisconsin's nice, but I had to go someplace warmer. So um, anyway, welcome everybody. And I have uh, uh, a, a guest that I've been really kind of enthused about having on the on the show for a long time. Um, most of you probably know who this this is without introduction. Uh, it's uh, author Frederick Stonehouse. Uh, Fred, thanks so much for being on the show, and welcome to Great Lakes Shipwrecks Live. Well, thank you for having me. I look forward to the evening. Yeah, it's going to really be a, 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 a fun night. Um, got a couple of, uh, of housekeeping things to take care of. Uh, first of all, I want to remind all of our guests tonight, if you want to ask questions to uh, Fred Stonehouse, feel free to, uh, to post your questions. Uh, we can see them as they come across in real time. Um, feel free to... Uh, start uh, posting to let us know you're, uh, you're online and that you can hear us. Um, we appreciate that. I see some uh, chat coming across already. Excellent. So thanks, everybody. Um, a couple of housekeeping things about the group. Um, as you know, the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group is an is a, a online forum for people interested in Great Lakes shipwrecks, but particularly in research, not so much in the dive videos or you know, the real common wrecks, but people who are interested in learning about the more obscure wrecks, and in particular, the wrecks that haven't been found yet. And so uh, I originally thought that this would just be a pretty small group with a bunch of my buddies, and it turned out that, heck, we're approaching our 2,000th member. I, I wouldn't have thought that. I just am uh, kind of gobsmacked by the fact that there are that many people on the Great Lakes uh, who are interested in Great Lakes shipwrecks. But I suppose that's no surprise to, to our guest, uh, Fred Stonehouse, who uh, has known that for years. So a couple of other things. Uh, new content, a lot of people have been posting really good content on the group. I want to thank everybody who does that. Uh, Wes Olszewski, our, uh, our guest last week, has posted some really cool videos about how to recognize a wooden shipwreck, similar to my Shipwrecks from Outer Space video. So check them out. It's some really fascinating content. Uh, I think last week I mentioned a, a fellow named Nick Smith who was finding wrecks all over the Great Lakes from uh, from outer space. But he's even found some new ones in areas that I have looked at from outer space. He's got an uncanny knack for it. So um, excellent work there. I think he just spotted one uh, in Fred's neck of the woods uh, off of Big Bay Point. I think uh, we don't know if it's the Cambridge or the Guiding Star, but it showed up from outer space now that uh, the water is, uh, uh, well, clearer because of the spring. A um, few other things. Uh, Lost Ship of the Month. Uh, people uh, asked for uh, me to write one up. Uh, I did the last one, the, the, the MV Jennifer, this video. This one is the Hiawatha. I, people said they wanted more obscure wrecks, so it doesn't get much more obscure than the little uh, little grain carrier Hiawatha that was uh, struck off of uh, Big Sable Point in 1866 by the steamer Oneida. Not many people have heard of her. She's out there on the bottom still waiting to be found. If you live over in the uh, Ludington area, she's out there on the shipping lane, probably not too far from the steamer Java. So a couple of good targets out there. Um, upcoming guests. Uh, as you know, I've been doing the show every week. I was going to you know, roll it back a little bit for the summer because you know, I'm going to be out, out on the water like the rest of you. But I've decided that since we're all locked down and uh, we ain't going nowhere uh, anytime soon, I'm going to keep going every week. So you can tune in every week for Great Lakes Shipwrecks Live. Uh, next week, we have uh, a, a really special guest. It's uh, Kathy Green. Kathy's the director of the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. And they've been doing a lot of interesting work interpreting shipwrecks there. Kathy's going to talk about some of that. She is an underwater archaeologist herself by trade and uh, has a long history with Wisconsin shipwrecks. So be a good evening talking about Wisconsin shipwrecks with Kathy. And uh, the week after that, we're going to go over to the Eastern Lakes. We've got Tom Kowalczyk on from Cleveland Underwater Explorers. And uh, Tom has found a lot of really cool wrecks out there, including, I think, the Anthony Wayne, one of the really early wrecks over on Lake Erie. And a uh, great guy and a really good researcher. Very excited to have Tom. Uh, Mark Sprang, the archivist from Bowling Green State University, uh, Historical Collections of the Great Lakes. Is going to be on the week after that and somewhere out there in the not too far distance i've got to set a date with him it's going to be ross richardson so you know we're really getting a lot of people who are really doing interesting stuff on the great lakes 
So feel free to join to join us for those shows. Um, but uh, one of the, the 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 big things I am excited about is you know uh, having Fred because Fred um, he, he he his books were the first books I ever bought. I I grew up most of you know up in the Copper Country, uh, the Keweenaw Peninsula of Michigan on Lake Superior, and I was really interested in Great Lakes shipwrecks, but there wasn't a whole lot out there you could buy, you know. And when I was 18 years old, I just graduated from high school. I used to ride my bike up to the Phoenix store in the little town of Phoenix up by Cliff Drive, all the way from Calumet. And I went up there one, one, one night and uh, I went into the store and uh, there on the shelf was this book, Keweenaw Shipwrecks. I didn't even know it existed. I bought it. I rode my bike home in the dark with a bunch of bears all around me because that's what it was like. <laughs> uh, you drove extra fast, you know. I had the book stuffed in my shirt, and I got home, and I couldn't put it down. I uh, I was hooked uh, after that. And so uh, those of you who know uh, the book, um, you know, long out of print, long out of print. But it got me interested in doing research because one of the things Fred did is he put his sources in there. And he did a lot of interpretation, too, in the books. And uh, I've uh, kind of that's kind of how I cut my teeth on it, you know. So a really uh, kind of seminal influence uh, in my life and in my interest in Great Lakes shipwrecks. So you know, really, really uh, privileged to have you on, Fred. Um, well, the honor is all mine. It, uh, it's a great opportunity to really talk to people about shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, particularly about what's happening on Lake Superior. And uh, if you're doing the big lake, you're doing the best. So we're, we're starting right at the top of the heap. Very cool. So one of the things that I uh, I really wondered about, and, and I've always kind of wondered about, is how a, a young guy from, from New Jersey gets interested in uh, the Upper Peninsula, comes to the middle of nowhere, and <laughs> yes, a, a very serious young man, if I might add, and goes on to be, you know become, become the face of Lake Superior shipwrecks, the mayor of Marquette, and a and a general in the National Guard. I mean, you've had an incredible run up there in Marquette, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how it happened? Well, I'll give you the first two. I never made general, but uh, <laughs> that would have been nice. Uh, long story. I grew up in New Jersey, and we had a shore house. And that's a house, a house on the beach, and that's where you, I literally grew up. So you grew up running up and down sand dunes, fishing, diving, swimming, boating, all of those activities, which included, of course, a little dose of pirate gold and a little dose of shipwrecks. So that was in your blood. That was part of your DNA coming from that portion of New Jersey right on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, graduated from high school, needed to find a university. A friend of mine the year before had gone out to Northern, liked it. Uh, suggested this might be a cool place, and I went along and took a look at it and really liked it. Liked it because it was about a plane and a half ride away from home, and I, I loved home, but if you're going off to school, my belief was you should be gone. In other words, not a commuter student somewhere. You should be literally on your own. So I liked that part of it, but you really looked at Lake Superior as kind of a bonus that you didn't quite understand yet. And by the time I finished with Northern, I understood the lake very well. And the opportunity to dive that lake and to be able to see some of the wonderful shipwrecks and some of the things that we were just beginning to explore, because this was really, I graduated in 1970. So in 1970, the environment of diving on the Great Lakes is of course, uh, stone age compared to what's going on now. But it was a different world that all of a sudden opened up. There also were very few people that actually were writing about diving at the time, especially on the Great Lakes. You had Bowen and Boyer, and that was about it. And you had an opportunity to begin to, to take a pen and put it to paper and talk to people directly about what you were seeing and what you were enjoying and maybe to get them interested in it too. But in the meantime, I needed a job. So I, um, I looked around and I picked up a teaching certificate along the way, but I couldn't see myself sitting down teaching high school for the next 40 years. And having a little bit of adventure in my soul, I went out and joined the Army. So I did a 27-year uh, a career in the Army, uh, eventually retiring uh, as a Corps of Engineer officer, uh, both with lots of active duty time as well as National Guard time, and just had a wonderful experience 
going places and seeing things that I never, ever thought I would have done. Uh, that did include a tour in Vietnam, but also included some little time in Turkey. I mean, what kid ever thinks he's going to be crossing the Bosphorus between Europe and Asia? Uh, whoever thinks you're going to be walking through the battlefield at Gallipoli? Uh, whoever thinks you're going to end up in the back uh, hills of Honduras during a construction project? Those types of activities as a Corps officer you were doing. And it was, uh, it was great. But all the while, you were keeping the opportunity for diving, you were keeping the opportunity for writing, you were keeping the opportunity for research, and a little bit of looking alive. So when time came to finally leave active service, you had an opportunity to do more of that and do it in, I think, a more disciplined manner simply because you had been doing it so tightly for so long that now you could open up that spigot a little bit and, and really get productive. So. That's kind of how I ended up in Marquette. And uh, because it's a wonderful city and a city that uh, I grew over time to really love, became involved with not local politics, that's a bad way to put it, but certainly the political env uh, environment of the city, serving on various city committees, serving as a city commissioner, and finally doing a stint as mayor too uh, for a year. And that was a, a lot of fun and a, a terrific amount of work. So that's kind of a long and the short of how you end up where you end up. It's a great story, Fred. And, and I have to say, Marquette has really just become a beautiful city with a lot of things going on. I, I just love going there. It's become a real premier destination uh, in the area. And maybe cruise ships coming to the area? Well, it, you know, Marquette has done extraordinarily well. And I'll take absolutely no credit for that because those decisions that were, that were taken to get it to where it is now were taken 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, by a, a large number of commissioners over time that really had their eyes set high. They knew what they wanted to do and they knew that they had to do it the right way. Uh, for example, the city of Marquette, unlike Traverse City, for example, we own 95% of our lakeshore. It's owned for the people, it's publicly owned, it's not privately owned, it's not a hotel sitting there on the water, it's publicly accessible property. And that is the third rail of Marquette politics. You always defend the lakeshore. And in fact, in the last uh, two, three years, we've been able to add another 1,600 foot uh, that we managed to acquire through a park project. Uh, we'll be doing a project this summer that will be adding a promenade structure on top of an old piling field right downtown that will be adding somewhere around another 1,600 feet of walkable dock for the public. So you're always working those issues within the city to, to really take care of our waterfront and really take care of how the public can access it. But that city has such a tremendous linkage to the, to the maritime world that it's just a wonderful, wonderful place to be, especially as a historian, because you get to see it and touch all this stuff kind of firsthand. Uh, I mean, I will, I will postulate that it was Marquette that really was the start in some regard to the American Industrial Revolution because it wasn't until they discovered the iron ore fields in Nagani, about 15, 20 miles to the west of the city, that there was access now to iron ore in an unlimited quantity that was literally 70% iron, direct shipping ore. And that was the ore that in the 1850s, 1860s, particularly during the American Civil War, when roughly 60% of all the, of the iron for the Union armies was coming out of the port of Marquette. And again, it's something that has not really been recognized within the history community. Hopefully I can get some recognition for that as we move on. Uh, but I can certainly ramble about Marquette forever because it has so much there. And if you haven't had a chance to come up and see the city, uh, please do come on up and, you know, once this, uh, this China virus thing is done, I, I think uh, the world will open back up and we'll be, uh, we'll be ready for people to come take a good look at our town. I'm looking forward to getting up there this summer, Fred. So one of the stories I like to tell, you know, I was just, I mentioned it to Wes last week is uh, I, I was at the Gales in November conference. So I think my first one, it was like 20 years ago or something like that. And I was with Dan Fountain. And uh, <clears throat> he told me that, that Fred Stonehouse might be there. 
And so I brought this huge stack of books with me to the conference. And I saw you there and I came up and I was like, Mr. Stonehouse, could, could you sign my books? And he looked at me and he said, all of them? <laughs> I said, would you? And you did, you signed the whole bloody stack. And I think the last thing you said to me is you're not gonna go selling those for more now, are you? <laughs> I said, no, sir. I, I promise. I, I, I absolutely remember that instance. And um, yeah, you just <laughs> kind of roll your eyes sometimes. But uh, yeah, what, it's, it's, you, you happily sign a book, but you never really want to sign a check. Uh, by putting that image up, though, Marquette Shipwrecks, you remind me that the Maritime Museum in town will be republishing that book on steroids. Uh, Marquette Shipwrecks is a book I did probably back in way back. I'll say 35 years ago, maybe. And it was intended then just to be kind of a survey of the maritime uh, disasters in the port. And now we're gonna take it up another level. And the hope is we'll have that out before summer gets over with. The uh, The manuscript's finished, it's just getting now through the publication side of it. That'd be great. It's, it's an excellent area for wreck diving too. A lot of people don't realize there's a lot of cool uh, dive sites there off Marquette. Do you guys still have a dive shop in Marquette? Well, unfortunately, no. We lost our dive shop. Uh, you know, diving on the Great Lakes has kind of really taken a, a drop, I think, in the numbers of people that are doing it. But the great advantage that the Big Lake has is we never had any any of the contamination. Uh, we never had zebra mussels. We still don't. So the, the, the clarity of the water that we had 40 years ago is still here. And that's remarkably good. I mean... You can almost look on it as the Caribbean on ice, uh, but it's just crystal clear. Yeah, it definitely is. I, uh, I One of the things that um, I've really enjoyed about Marquette, too, is, as you mentioned, you know, the, the mining history coming from the Keweenaw up there. It was copper, of course, you know, but um, the Marquette, I think we always thought of it as the big city, you know, uh, going to civilization kind of when we uh, take the, the hour and a half drive to Marquette to go shopping or to, you know, do something, uh, something uh, cultured, <laughs> as it were. Well, we, you know, we still consider ourselves to be the capital city of the, of the Upper Peninsula, uh, certainly the educational, medical, banking center of, of the UP. Uh, when we, we still are and growing well because what's happening, of course, is that you've got a turnover in population and the last time I looked at the census numbers, it was something like 35 or 36 percent of the adult population holds a college degree or better. Wow. And more typical for a Michigan city is going to be somewhere around 12 or 14 percent. Uh, Houghton, I think, is punching about 44. A great influence, obviously, of Michigan Tech. Yeah. And I think Ann Arbor is about 54. Uh, so we're not bad. We're, we're swinging in there. But what that creates then is a different dynamic in the city of people who want things, know how to get things, know the value of collaboration and communication. So you, you've, you've got the opportunity for more dynamos spinning and more people telecommuting and more people that can be anywhere in the world and choose to be in Marquette where they've got not only the, the big lake, but they've got great dining and all that kind of stuff but they also have the access to the world through the net. Very true. So let's take a, let's shift gears a little bit, Fred. One of the things that uh, I know uh, we, we wanted to talk about is uh, a big find that happened recently. Uh, and it's uh, uh, one of Marquette's most emblematic wrecks, the Henry B. Smith. Uh, this is, uh, it was a Holy Grail shipwreck of Lake Superior. Um, and I know this is one that interests you as well. Um, what can you tell us about it? I know our viewers, a lot of them may not be aware that this ship was the largest ship still missing on the Great Lakes, and it was, it's was it been found. It, it, it was. Um, I give full credit to certainly Jerry Eliason and uh, um, Ken, uh, Ken Merriman uh, and Craig Smith, because those were the three guys who went out and literally picked it right off the bottom within 20 minutes. Uh, but that was a, a whole different story in itself. Henry B. Smith is really Marquette's contribution to the Great Gale, the Great Freshwater Storm, the White Hurricane of 1913. Uh, you might recall 250 dead sailors, 17 ships wrecked, nine of the modern ore carriers like the Smith lost with all hands. And it's, it's only been one by one they've been being picked off by technology, and the Smith is a great example of that. 
525 foot long, uh, built down Lorraine, Ohio, very typical of the freighters at the time. The joke was, of course, that they were building them by the mile and just cutting them off to whatever length the owner wanted. <laughs> One after another, after another. But uh, she gets caught in the big gale. Uh, she's up down the Marquette floor. She will make it into the city. She'll find the dock. But because the storm is still going, you've got a combination of snow and rain that's freezing the ore in the pockets of the dock. So that causes her to be delayed for a day before they can finally load, clear out the pockets, get enough iron on her. And then she will leave downbound for Cleveland. But when she leaves, to the captain, it looks like the storm has blown itself out. Uh, weather reporting, as you might understand, in 1913 was certainly somewhat of a voodoo science. And uh, his guess was as good as anybody, so he leaves. Unfortunately, he'll get about oh, five or six miles out before the storm will return in its full ferocity. Uh, the ship will be seen to turn to the uh, port, heading up to the Keweenaw, apparently, trying to dodge in behind the Keweenaw Peninsula and get out of those really powerful northwest winds. And that's the last of it. She's gone. Uh, they'll find the body of the second cook floating about 60 miles off Whitefish Point. Following spring, the body of the second engineer on a block of ice uh, up by uh, the Canadian shore, Coppermine Point. And for 1913 until May of 2013, she was gone. A lot of folks looked for her with conventional side scan, a lot of time spent mowing the grass out there. At one point, we were able to get a, uh, a U.S. Navy Orion P-3 aircraft, which is a sub-hunter, designed quite literally to find Russian submarines hiding under the polar ice. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but high technology as magnetic anomaly detection gear, and they didn't find it. And then we managed to get the Navy up with one of their mine countermine boats, uh, feeling if they could find a mine on the bottom of the ocean, they ought to be able to find a 525 foot ore carrier full with iron ore. And they didn't have any luck either. But it wasn't until uh, Eliasson and company were able to use and leverage the Freedom of Information Act with the federal government to get all of the data in, in North America, quite literally, dealing with federally accessible magnetic anomaly records. Wow. And slowly, uh, uh, Jerry's wife, uh, Karen, went through those records. And Karen is a software engineer, uh, very brilliant. And Jerry is a hardware engineer. But Karen's a lot more brilliant than Jerry is. <laughs> she was able to build the algorithms that took that data and then, in fact, boiled it down to a series of hotspots on a chart. And then you could take that chart and overlay it with a conventional chart that showed where shipwrecks were. And all of a sudden you were finding magnetic hits, places where there were not shipwrecks known. And then you were finding those same hits to be sitting on top of a known shipwreck. So clearly the technology and the application of it was solid. The trick now was to go out and look at those other ones that didn't identify. So they will take a small boat, they'll trottle out from uh, Big Bay, Michigan, they were about 25 miles out or so, put the uh, side scan down. And now their side scan is a homemade unit. You know, they're not writing a check for $50,000. They literally are building it. And that's Jared, who's Jerry's son, who was more brilliant than all of them. And he'll pick it up within 20 minutes. And from then on, it's a drop camera also built by Jared to uh, assure that um, it was the right wreck and it was Henry B. Smith across the stern. So they, they got her. Wow. It's a great story of how the little guy, the guy without the money and without all the backing is able to go out and do exactly what the big boys do, the big federal agencies with a lot more money and a lot more time wasted. But that's kind of the democracy we live in. It's a great story. Uh, this past summer, I was up in uh, Eagle Harbor with my little sonar scanning uh, the, the Eagle Harbor wrecks. And I spotted uh, sitting up on a trailer in the parking lot, a sea dory. And I knew right yep. away who it was. I went over yep. there. I said, hey, guys, how you doing? I hadn't seen them in a couple of years. And uh, I could tell they had an unusual smile on their face. And they both had a couple of, were having a couple of beers. And uh, 
I said, hey, I found a new wreck in Eagle Harbor. And they said, guess what? We found a new one off Eagle Harbor. <laughs> and uh, they had found the uh, Hudson. Um, yep. They showed me the video. They showed me their side scan. And we kind of swapped, uh, had a few beers together and swapped stories. What, what some great guys. And, you know, uh, the story of how they found that, having to actually put the whole side scan unit down on a sled hundreds of feet under the water with its power source is just amazing. I mean, who would have thought out of the box like that to do that, you know? Just like you say, brilliant. Um, I, I, power to the to, power to the people, power to the little guy that can go out and make this happen by using only his God-given brains. And that's a wonderful thing to see happen. I was out on the Smith uh, with the folks from Whitefish Point and the Boyd, uh, as well as Tom Crossman was on board too and used the big sled to shoot some video of the Smith and she's broken in two, uh, pretty well separate about in the middle, uh, sitting on a pile of iron ore. Um, pilot house smashed down pretty well, leveled. You could argue whether that was water pressure or exploding boilers, uh, but the bow of the boat is, is completely intact and really, uh, really quite spectacular. Uh, Tom was able to take the little unit he had and fly it right through the pilot house door into the house. And you could see the telephone hanging down on the cable. You could see the clock up on the wall. You could see the chart table in the back. And of course, the engine room telegraph, the wheel, all of it sitting there. And on board the boat that day, we also had the grand niece of the captain, Jimmy Owen. And it was a kind of a moving moment for her because she had always heard the story of the Smith and her relationship with it. And finally, to be able to see it under those circumstances was uh, really, uh, really something very special to her, and I think to all of us too. What an incredible moment, um, Fred! Uh, obviously, this is a deep, deep wreck. Is this uh, something that's in diveable depths, or is it uh, four, five, six, seven hundred feet? Uh, well, it's like five hundred, so plus or minus. Wow, that's a that's a, a ways down there, and it, it's a it's a farther from shore than I I had thought she would be. I guess uh, I remember they, I was at their talk about it and I was surprised where it actually ended up. It was further out than I, I think we, I thought certainly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to hide the, the location of it. I truly don't remember, I'll say 25 miles. It's uh, yeah. two hours out by boat. Yeah, I, I saw where in general on a map it is. I was a little surprised because uh, the conventional wisdom on this one was a little off. And uh, they, you gotta give those guys credit for uh, thinking about that magnetic anomaly data. and. That's why I say they're all going to be found because this isn't the only magnetic anomaly that they're looking at. And so uh, that'll be interesting. We know the bell's still hanging on it. And Tom was able to take the little sled and the grab arm and grab the lanyard and ring the bell. Wow. <laughs> you can hear it ring, but you could see the motion watching this happen. Sure. So I look forward to getting back out on this wreck and again, continuing to see some of the interesting things on or some of the features. You know, one of the things that's always irritated me is that we've got this fixation that a shipwreck is a, is a time capsule. And, you know, the reality is, no, it's not. It's a shipwreck. It's a pile of boards and a pile of stuff or a pile of steel. What's important about it is the story that it tells. What's important with the Smith is the story of not only the wreck proper, but her part in the Industrial Revolution. Her part in this long, and having her set it, the long ship's passing, of how she was part of that great industrial machinery. That's the real story to these wrecks. Not this, look, I found a, a, a plate thing. I found a, a cup, and we're going to put them in the museum, and it's going to be cool, and we're going to call it underwater archaeology. Oh, come on, it's not King Tut's tomb. <laughs> it's a six ore carrier. But the story that it tells is something special. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, the Henry B. Smith is obviously one of those iconic wrecks, but um, earlier this this um, this year, I had uh, Stephen Robley from Michigan Tech on the program. And one of the things that he was talking about was uh, another wreck that I know you've been uh, pretty heavily involved in uh, over the years. I think some of the original research that came out about it came from, from you know, your contacts and your your interpretation. And, and that's the French minesweepers, uh, Cirrusols and uh, and Inkerman. And they're uh, two wrecks uh, up off the Keweenaw that I you know uh, have always been somewhat interested in. 
um, ever since the old commercial fisherman Art Lassinen told me he thought he snagged something off of one of them. He, he bring, could bring his nets up about 40 feet. They were in real deep water, and then he couldn't get them up any further. It was like he was snagged on a big boom or something with his nets, and uh, and that's of course what he thought they were snagged on. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, your relationship with these wrecks? Well, you know, like a lot of people, you're you're really enthralled by the story of them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these French minesweepers, they're built in Thunder Bay or at Port Arthur. They get lost on their trip going down and rat, 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 that big storm. Uh, and then you get all the garbage stuff out that, well, the crew wasn't trained and they had held these things together with wooden pegs and all of this, this conspiracy mythology nonsense. But these two, when they're found, well, they're going to be special when they're found. But they were part of a bigger story. And that bigger story is World War I and the mine sweeping effort that was going on and the use of mines in World War I and the interaction of these little bitty mine sweepers and the important role they played within the greater war. And that's the real story to these things, this little fleet of them, a little fleet of a dozen boats. They're about 145 foot long. They're steel hull, uh, 36 French sailors per uh, vessel, uh, at least one Great Lakes Mar or Great Lakes pilot on each of the boats. But people have looked for them for a long time. <laughs> I mean, I go back 20 years and people have been looking for these minesweepers, sure. and they're all looking off the tip of the Keweenaw. And you think maybe if people figured out that they mowed the grass and, you know, they didn't find the rock. <laughs> They've got to begin to look in other places. And in the process of doing the research on these things, I've come up with a couple of other other places that might be logical too. So we'll see if that, uh, that ever does shake out. But the story that I think would be most worth thinking about is these two boats are French war graves. I mean, you've got 36 French sailors on that ostensibly were lost in the period of war. If they're found, all of a sudden, the entire weight of the French Empire is going to come down on them because they're French naval vessels. Oh, sure. So anybody who's taking pictures, anybody who's trying to do any documentation on them, anybody, et cetera, et cetera, instantaneously, I think, would be engulfed in this whole controversy of the French government and their claim to them. And the French, remember, went after the Griffin as soon as somebody thought they had a credible find. Yep. The French went after and grabbed La Belle, which was another one of LaSalle's ships down in Texas, uh, off of Texas, when they found her about, about 10, 15 years ago now. Mm -hmm. and then I think, uh, she was part of that expedition to get a colony going down there. And the second, the, the University of Texas archaeologists went to work on her and recovered all of the good stuff. French came in, made a deal with the Americans. Uh, Marion Albright was Secretary of State then. And all that stuff is now under the ownership of France. So this is a different, these are different boats. And what happens if you only find one? Where's the other? Because the operating theory has always been they collided and sank. But if you only find one, that's probably not true. And if you've got Great Lakes pilots on the boat, and the Great Lakes pilots, the one thing about any pilot is he wants to stay away from the other boat. Yeah. The likelihood of them coming close is nil. Even if you, even if one of them got in trouble, the other one would not dare come close to try and remove crew because the weather was too rough. Plus, we've got 78 French sailors, which means you ought to have at least 78 life jackets not a single one was ever recovered. So ask yourself, were they? If you had the sailors on the boats and they knew they were in trouble, would not they be wearing their life jackets? Some of them would. So the argument becomes, where are they? <laughs> because everybody searched. The search effort to try and find these after they knew they were missing was, was gargantuan. But they still came up blank. It's quite a mystery. 
So Fred, uh, I remember having a conversation with you years ago about some French naval uh, maritime documents were actually written in sort of French maritime language that had uh, uh, some original accounts uh, about the, the, the Sarasols and Anchorman that you um, interpreted and gave well, a particular insight. Can you talk about those a little bit? I sure have you have to. I didn't interpret it way back. I'll go okay. back to ago. Uh, when I began to get interested in this, you you asked the dumb question. There must have been an investigation. I wonder who performed it. Obviously, the French Navy performed it. So therefore, I contacted the French uh, Naval Attaché in Washington and, in effect, asked the question, do you have a report, a documentation dealing with the loss of these vessels and subsequent investigation there, too? And lo and behold, about two months later, I get this big bulky package in the mail that is the, the investigation of the French Navy into the loss of these vessels. Wow. And of course, it's written in France, in French. So that's easy. I don't read French. So I probably spend five years shopping it around to people who can speak French, asking, gee, would you mind translating this? And the answer I always got back was, A, it's too big, I'm not going to try, or B, I can't do it because I don't understand the words didn't make sense. I'm having a drink at uh, one of the meetings of the Association of Great Lakes Maritime History way back. And I, f I forgot, I'm going to protect his, his, his name on this one, but it was a curator from a museum in Canada. And I mentioned my conundrum. And he looks at me, laughs and says, give me 50 bucks as a donation to the museum and I'll take care of the translation. Fine. So I gave him the 50 bucks, sent him the document. And about three months later, I get the whole thing back all translated. And I call him back up and said, how did you do this? Because part of the difficulty was the words that were used, many of them were French naval lingo. Yeah. It wasn't something you would find in the French version of Webster's. So he explained to me, well, dummy, this is Canada. We are a bilingual nation. <clears throat> documentation for the Navy, Canadian Navy, is done both in English and in French. So I just had the Canadian Navy translate it for me. Ah. <laughs> so I gave a copy to him so he could have it for his museum. I gave one to Tom Farnquist. Uh, Tom had asked for one, and there's two or three others floating around. That's all the original material because you say, look, let's get it out there, and maybe somebody can help solve this mystery. Did it say where they were? I'm sorry? Did, did it say where they were, where they went down? Um, not to the point of any usefulness uh, because they disappeared. Well, their operating premise was they, they established what they thought their operating premise on, on where they were was or what had happened, maybe. But it made no definite decision as to here, 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 or here or even what happened. They just set up a whole sense, a set of hypothesis of what could have happened because there were no witnesses. In other words, the vessel that survived, the third boat was safely tucked away in Bay Degree. The other two never showed up at Bay Degree, never showed up anywhere. Yep. I, Except, go ahead. Up at the French fishing village, uh, just east of Otterhead, Port Richardson, I think, French, Canadian fishing village, uh, uh, yeah, Port Richardson, there was a report from a lumber company operating up there the night of the storm, the night these ships should have been lost, that they had heard uh, distress whistles of steamers, and they had gone far enough to uh, put a special lamp up on a post to guide them into the harbor. Really? End of game. No more. Uh, the investigation decided that that was not a credible uh, alternative. But you had lots of stories like that along the north shore of Lake Superior. If you've ever been up there, it's a staggeringly beautiful place. It is a beautiful coastline. It's absolutely 100% different than you have on the south side. But it's extraordinarily rugged. Uh, harbors are few and far between. So if you're a vessel in trouble on the north shore, you're really in trouble because there's not a lot of places to lay to to anchor or shelter and of course the water runs deep so you could be laying right off the coast and nobody would know very interesting story it sounds like we still have a mystery on our hands it's a great mystery and we'll we'll see where it finally leads right 
definitely. Uh, these are some that I think will be some of the last uh, of the of the mysteries solved on the on the lakes. So let's segue into a different topic. Um, one of the things that I know you and I share an interest in, and, and I, I think I probably got some I interested in it from reading your work, is uh, the U.S. Life Saving Service. I just did a little uh, video on how to use the annual reports for uh, for research and how to use the station logs and the rec reports. But uh, I understand that, I mean, you wrote one of the seminal works on it, but then also you've got some more stuff coming out. Why don't you talk about that a little? Sure. Um, if you drill down to get to the bottom of me, you'll find that this is what I'm really interested in. This is the thing that I, I tremendously enjoy working with more than any others, which is the life-saving service, whether it's on salt water or on fresh water. Because I've never found an instance where you have such a great group of, I want to say, selfless people but of pure American heroes than the men of the old life-saving service. And for 44 years, they did things that were, frankly, I think impossible to do, and they did them on a regular basis. Uh, the joke was, of course, that they were heroes on 96 cents a day. And these men paid for their own uniforms. They paid for their own food. Uh, there was no government gratuity uh, or death gratuity. There was no insurance provided. There was nothing. And the season, you were laid off, laid off. You were fired, and you may be rehired back the following spring, or may not, depending on the whim of the keeper. But they, the organization existed for 44 years. Uh, we had 61 stations on the Great Lakes, of uh, about 270 or so nationwide. The Putting that 96 cents a day, by the way, into in the perspective, uh, at the time, a lake sailor was getting $2 a day and was being fed and was being housed. So that kind of establishes some relative value. But I finished a book, finished a draft of a book on the 16 life-saving service crews nationwide. There were only 16 that received the gold life-saving medal. Uh, as in recognition of a particular uh, the dangerous rescue they performed. And those medals are extraordinarily rare. Uh, for example, the well, last time I checked is about uh, 3,400, I believe, uh, medals of honor that have been awarded. And there's somewhere around, I think, 700 life-saving medals. So extraordinarily rare. Uh, we're lucky in Marquette. We have one of them from the uh, L.C. Waldo wreck up in the Keweenaw in 1913. Oh, very neat. You got that at the Marquette Maritime Museum? We have uh, Captain McCormick's. Uh, he was the ke uh, keeper up at uh, Eagle Harbor, and we obtained that through his granddaughter uh, probably 30 years ago. But big uh, seven-eighth inch diameter gold medals and tended to be worn on the chest with the ribbon attached, much like service medals are, are awarded today, or worn today. But these guys were something special. That was a, an extraordinary breed. And the, um, the ability to research with this group and to try and get in their mindset and to understand how they operated, what they thought, is just a, a, a real, to me, it's, it's very enjoyable to put yourself in that frame of mind and to be able to reach out and to find the resources that help bring all of that into, into perspective. Uh, there was one case, for example, out in North Nantucket where they did a particularly difficult rescue. Uh, it took them three days afloat, three days in the boat afloat in a storm because they could make it out to the wreck that was stuck on a, on, a, on a ledge. They managed to get the crew off. They had to wait for the tide to turn to be able to make any progress coming back. Anchor, wait, tide, turn, do it again, all the while bailing, shivering. Remember, this was a period of history when you did not have Gore-Tex. You only had oil skins and cotton and maybe some wool. And that was it. And these guys are out there literally freezing themselves to death. They will finally make it to shore. The one fellow who will perish, lifesaver from the rescue, as he dies, his last words to the, the skipper, to the captain, the crew, is I guess this gets us a, a, a stovepipe or a, a, a stove cover. And they call the metal sto uh, stove covers because they were big enough that, you know, the old ones used to go on top of the wood stove burner units. 
But then you put yourself in the framework of the, the, the husbands or husbands of the women and the children as their sole breadwinner leaves to go out and try and make one of these rescues and you have no guarantees coming back. So great organization. And this particular book is my favorite of all the ones I've done. And of all the ones I've done, it's also sold the least. Really? Uh, that's okay because it really becomes more academic than it becomes something more of general interest. But I wanted to do it because I felt somebody ought to put one out that actually lays it down, provides the facts, provides the references, provides the material, because increasingly you were seeing maritime museums incorporate life-saving into whatever they were displaying, and they would usually ball it all up. Yes. Well, the good people, well-intended with zero knowledge. And this at least provided the knowledge base for what they were doing, what they had, and what the bigger storyline is. In 1915, they became the Coast Guard, and things went downhill ever since. <laughs> well, it's a great book, Fred. And I'm really looking forward to, you say there's another manuscript that you have coming out on the 16 metal yeah. thing. So no. more, I can't wait to, to see that. That's got to be a fascinating. Uh, well, I've had it, you know, I've had it done now about four years, five years. And I keep going back to it because it's too much fun. <laughs> you don't ever really want to say you're done with it because you're enjoying the act of research and the act of writing so much. Definitely. I, I yes, find if they're interested in something like this, there is a group called the U.S. Life Saving Heritage Association. Uh, I, for about five years, I was a president. Uh, it's a national group. We've got about 600 members or so, and generally comprised of people that are intensely interested in this topic and that work with local museums, give out some grants, give out some awards, all of them focusing on life-saving uh, or the life-saving organization. An excellent organization. Yeah, I've, I've done a little bit of uh, of, of research with the life saving service and they they're an excellent resource so the, Brad, uh, go ahead well, i gotta segue one more time the fellow that was a general superintendent of this sumner increase kimball 44 years retired at age 81 81 federal government only superintendent they ever had if you find a picture of him look at it because his crews used to call him the beady-eyed little bastard and I think, I think they smiled when they said it, but he's established standards that were high. And if you ever fail to meet his standards, you you were fired. Captain, crew, you're gone. That was the expectation he had. He was a graduate, too. There he is, a beady-eyed little bastard. He was a graduate of Bowdoin College, Maine. One of his classmates was Joshua Chamberlain. That ring any bell? Not off the top of my head. I'll tell you. Okay, you got to segue down to the military side because Joshua Chamberlain was commanding officer of the 20th Maine Volunteer Infantry. 20 Maine was the group on the top of Little Round Top at the second day of Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, turned back the last ditch Confederate charge, and uh, later would uh, end up as a, a major general of the uh, Union Army during the Civil War. But another guy with true grit. I can find no evidence they knew each other. I can find no evidence they ever had beer or they ever enjoyed each other's company, but they were certainly two people of the same character at the same place at the same time. So I've got to believe that at some point they met. It seems likely. I just happen to have this image sitting around because I just did a, a video on uh, the life saving service. It's a great story, Fred. Um, one of the things that I have to do, I, I, I promised, uh, a number of our viewers that I would do, and I apologize to the rest of our viewers, but we've got Fred Stonehouse here, and so we have to talk about the Edmund Fitzgerald. Um, so, Fred, what what when did you decide to write this book, and did you ever think that it was going to have legs like this? The answer is uh, no. I did not. I was the, I had no real desire to do, to do the book. Uh, it just was a shipwreck. I, I viewed it as current events. And it took me a little bit of time to realize that dummy, yes, this is current events, but what's the difference between writing about a shipwreck that occurred 100 years ago and writing about one that occurred two months ago? The 100-year one, you've got to drill down through history to get to the bottom of it. 
This one, you can walk in the side door because it's all happening and still happening around you. So you become more of, of a, a gatherer of information that's occurring simultaneously as opposed to a historian trying to pe you know, pick the pieces back up from, from the past. So that was one reason because I, I really felt that it really needed to be done. And the book in its original context was a little different than the one that's out now over time. It's been 45 years, so you change a few things, you move a few things around, you take maybe a little different perspective on things. But in talking with the publisher a few years ago, we concluded that over time, over that 45 year interval, we probably sold somewhere around a quarter million books. Wow. Now for Great Lakes, any region, that's a huge number. Now, I didn't make a quarter million dollars on this thing because there were various other issues involved with it. Like the original publisher went bankrupt and you went through bankruptcy court when they owed you a bunch of money and you found out that you're the bottom of the pile to get anything. <laughs> well, that didn't happen, but there was a lot of the books out there. But yes, this is, uh, this is a great story. Go into any grammar school in the Great Lakes area, ask the kids for two shipwrecks, names, you'll get Titanic and Fitzgerald. They won't know particularly much about either, but they will know the name. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing for the Fitzgerald because it really does stress the idea that the men and the women now that are working out on the Great Lakes are doing so for all of us. And they have a tough job, they do it well, and somehow they need to be remembered. And the same thing with the folks that sank with Fitzgerald, the same thing with the folks that sank with every other shipwreck on the Great Lakes. We should remember our history. We should remember them. Definitely. And I think Gordon Lightfoot's song obviously did a wonderful job of, of memorializing. The oh, event. huge, huge. I mean, I'm not, please, I'm not trying to say all this goes on because of my book. My book simply was there. Uh, but Lightfoot was the one that carried the weight. Yeah, it's really a haunting song, and he kind of captures the the, the the mythology and the ethos of, you know, Great Lakes maritime history and shipwrecks. And it was a thing that a lot of people in the country didn't know about, that the Great Lakes had thousands of shipwrecks and this huge cultural history, you know, during the Industrial Revolution of people just going out and risking their lives to deliver cargoes. And I think that brought it home to everybody, particularly here. Well, and Fitzgerald's become the poster child for all shipwrecks on the lakes. And that's not a bad thing because you now have something that's the point for all of it, something to be remembered. And that partially explains why so many people go up to Whitefish just to see the bell. Why so many go up for the bell ceremony, same, same. Definitely. I'd like to encourage our listeners to uh, ask any questions. I, I've seen a lot of comments. I appreciate that. But if anybody has any questions for Fred, uh, feel free to float them. Um, I don't get them in necessarily in real time. There's a little bit of a lag. So if I don't see them right away, I apologize. But uh, feel free to ask them. Um, so I know uh, one of the things that uh, we've got a little bit of time left, Fred, that um, um, we were going to talk a little bit about is the Bannock burn. Um, I just did a re sort of re-researching of the Bannock burn, uh, the flying Dutchman of Lake Superior. Um, what are your thoughts about the chances of her ever being found? Oh, I have no doubt that it'll be picked up. All of the shipwrecks will be because technology simply is getting too good, too much, and too cheap. And they'll, you know, they'll find her. Uh, you know, conventional wisdom always said she's out of Superior Shoal. Uh, that she hit the shoal in the, in the storm she was in and literally down she goes into hundreds of feet of water. And there was some uh, rumor that there was a survey vessel out there, I think, uh, what well, was Bayfield, I think, that did the original look on her, not Bayfield, Margaret, and uh, had managed to scrape up a, put a grapple down or something, and then coming up the shoal had come up with some rust on the grapple. And from that, the determination was made the ship was obviously there, maybe, right? But you, you know, history is connecting the dots. You've got the Superior sh uh, Shoal story for the Knockburn, maybe. But Superior Shoal was found, the original heavy survey work that was done on Superior Shoal was done by the uh, U.S. Lake Survey ship Perry. Perry was one of the minesweepers built at Thunder, Port Arthur. 
as the Botson. And she later would be sold, never becoming a minesweeper, but sold private. She would be used by Admiral Byrd down in the Antarctic in one of his expeditions, and later would make its way to the Lake Survey and eventually back out to Lake Superior and back out to really not all that far from where they built her. So you're connecting the dots. Definitely. Yeah. Some theories say boiler explosion. That's kind of hard to believe with a roughly new ship. I think she was only nine years old. But it's another example where you take a ship and you say, it's not the time capsule. Forget about that nonsense. It's part of a larger story because she was 245 feet long. The reason she was built that was because she was a canaller. The reason she was a canaller was to go through the small locks in the Welland Canal and the St. Lawrence Seaway, which set up that whole trade situation that of salt water coming in, why they built the St. Lawrence Seaway later, small locks here, how that impacted naval construction on the Great Lakes in World War I and World War II, because you couldn't send boats out through those little locks. Lots and lots of stories that tie into this beyond simply saying, look, I found a tea kettle or something. Right, right. Yeah, an interesting piece of cultural history with a broad story to tell, I think, you know, particularly for Canadian shipping. But uh, Fred, we got a couple of... Um, of questions coming in uh somebody's asking uh do you have a favorite great lakes ghost story great lakes boat tours i presume they mean cruising no great lakes ghost story oh, ghost story so we have lots of ghost stories and one of them of course involves the binocular uh which is supposedly for a long period in our history maybe about 100 years starting about the 1840s rolling up to maybe about 1930 or so if you had a ship on the lakes that sank under mysterious circumstances with all hands, i.e. disappeared in a storm, for a while, people would claim to be seeing it again. And there would be uh, sailors on another ship that would report, well, I just saw the, the ghost ship Binocburn go by. Uh, or you, sometimes lighthouse keepers would make those reports. Were they real? Were they fake? Were they false? Who knows? Many of them seem very credible. Uh, when you tie them together, uh, for example, the Lambden, when that sunk at the eastern end of the lake, a crew of the Tug Reliance, including the head of the Canadian Lighthouse Service on board, reported that they had seen, again, the Lambden cruising blithely along through gale and storm and whatever. But he might be referring to the Haunted Lake series of books I did, uh, which uh, Haunted Lakes 1, 2, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and all of those came from just research as you were going through looking for other things and you'd find the snippet of a ghost story or a superstition story. You throw that in a box labeled weird stuff. Eventually the weird stuff box gets filled up. You look at it and you realize there's enough in here for a pretty good book because this is an interesting topic. Some of which is true, some of which obviously isn't, some of which is just belief, but all of it becomes the fabric of the Great Lakes. So while it's not historical fact, it's part of that fabric that makes us maybe better understand the fact or place the fact into a better perspective. So take a box of this stuff. At the same time, they were just finally opening up the Ivan Walton collection at the Bentley Historical Library at University of Michigan. Walton was the folklorist at U of M back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s and was a great collector of this type of material. He would go around the lakes with a wire tape recorder wire tape recorder. Uh, he'd go to Beaver Island with a couple of bottles of Jameson, find the Gallagher boys, and get all the Irish stories, for example. But all this stuff ends up in 22 boxes in the Bentley, utterly, totally disorganized, just boxes filled with stuff. And the Bentley had finally given up trying to put any semblance of order to them, so they just threw them open the researchers. And when I got in there, what I found was that I had half of his story or he had half of my story. And you could put the two together and really have some validity to it. But from that, then you build some of these great ghost stories that appear in the books. But remember, they're all real ghost stories. I'm not saying the ghost is real. I'm saying the story is real. Sure. That's what I'm not. I mean, I can't. You tell me a story. You saw something. I've got to say, OK, sounds good to me. Part of our cultural history, those stories. It all is. And again, it adds that fabric to the Great Lakes. It adds that little bit of something special. Very true. Very true. We have one other question, which I think I'll, I'll dispense with 
fairly quickly, but you can chime in on it too. Uh, somebody's asking if anyone's looking for the A.L. Hopkins. I'm familiar with A.L. Hopkins a little bit. She's pretty far out there. I don't think anybody is looking for her because the grid is uh, prohib prohibitively large. I think she's wooden, so she won't show up as an anomaly. Fred, any thoughts on the A.L. Hopkins? No, I think you're completely right. Yeah, I've not heard of anybody that's looking for her, but it's not a wreck. It's a wreck that I'm sure Fred and I both know about. Um, so i um, going to start wrapping up because it is 8 o'clock. Um, it's been a, a great evening of conversation, Fred, and I really enjoyed hearing you know you talk about the stories and why it's important to tell the stories in the cultural history and you know not the, not so much the object of the shipwreck. That's a really important theme, I guess, that you've, you've gotten across tonight. And so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Let me just throw one caveat in, or one thing to think about, is when you write, you have two people, you have two groups to write for. You can write for historians, who cares? They're just gonna argue amongst themselves anyway. <laughs> or you can write for people that actually read books and enjoy them, and that's called the public. And most of what I've done has kind of been more directed at what the public would like to see because they're the people that carry the history programs. They're the people that watch the TV, that read the books, that buy the books. They're the people that go out and see the lakes, enjoy the lakes, and become part of the history as opposed to an academician necessarily who doesn't do that. There's, this, there's, there's room for both of them, but you kind of have to make a decision, what's my audience? Very true. Very Which true. Kid books I did, and uh, you know those were just. Uh, <laughs> obviously, we had an audience there too, as long as you're about nine years old. <laughs> yep, very true. Well, and I think you made the right choice because you obviously get a lot of readership, and the, your books are very meaningful to a lot of people. They brought a lot of enjoyment, but they've also helped tell the story of the Great Lakes. And I think you and I had an exchange on Facebook where we both kind of really looked up to and enjoyed Walt Havinghurst's book, The Long Ship's Passing. And I think in ways you write kind of like that, telling those important cultural stories. 100%, I can think of no better writer on the Great Lakes after all these years. I think the book came out in 1944, 43, and he's still number one. Yeah, he could really turn a phrase, and, uh, and he was an award-winning author. Just a, if, if anybody who hasn't read *The Longship's Passing*, it's just a wonderful, a wonderful read, and uh, it inspired me, and uh, clearly Fred as well. So, um, Fred, any parting thoughts before uh, I start to wrap it up? Well, I guess the only parting thought I would give you is the realization for people that the lakes, to a point, are also being recognized by the cruising industry, because we're seeing an increasing numbers of small cruise ships on the Great Lakes. Any, carrying anywhere between 80 and perhaps 400 people. Uh, this summer before the, you know, the big CV came in, uh, we were scheduled to have six ships. And we've never had six before. Uh, Viking, for example, will be here next summer. Uh, Viking cruises, that's pretty good. Uh, Panat will have another ship on the lakes for a couple of cruises. And that will be La Champlain. And of course, Victory's got two. Pearl Mist's got one. Uh, Blount's got two more. So it's recognition of people for this very special environment that we all get to enjoy. For We take it for granted, but I guarantee I do a fair amount of work on the ships. And when I do a, a lecture on the lakes, I will guarantee that by day two, somebody will come up to me and say, I never knew as you're going up the middle of Lake Michigan and you can't see shore. I never knew anything this big existed. Very cool. Well, Fred, thank you so much for uh, coming on to the show. I know uh, you've been one of our people that have been requested a lot to be on the show. And, and it's a great time with all of us locked down uh, and needing to stay safe. So uh, thank you so much for coming on and, uh, and being available to, uh, to our public here in the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. Well, you're very welcome. And thank you for having me. It's been a fun evening. Yep, likewise, Fred. And a couple of housekeeping things, guys. Uh, don't forget, next week, Kathy Green will be on the show, the director of the Wisconsin Maritime Museum. We'll be talking about some Wisconsin shipwreck topics. Um, after that, we've got Tom Kowalczyk from uh, Lake Erie, Cleveland Underwater Explorers, and uh, and a whole slew of guests. Uh, I'm going to be doing these every week until, we, uh, until we're out of lockdown. Um, 
this particular uh, show will be visible on this Great Lake Shipwreck Research Group. But for those of you who have friends and family who aren't members of the group or just don't want to join the group, um, I post these on, on YouTube. So this will be uploaded to the YouTube channel. The Great Lake Shipwreck Research Group has a YouTube channel called Great Lake Shipwreck Research. You can also view this out there. I'll have it uploaded tonight. So thank you again, Fred. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight and for making it a, a great show and for making our group a really interesting group to belong to. Good night, everybody. Good night.